primary care being provided by places like uh, uh, like gold standard pediatrics. You pay a monthly fee, mm -hmm. and your your kid is taken care of whatever you know the sniffles, the uh, flu shots, the you know whatever whatever uh, maladies that they have, whether it's a lot or a little. Uh, it's paid for with a monthly fee. And the physician and the family have an no, incentive. But again, no insurance. Well, the family and the uh, uh, clinic or physician have an incentive to keep people healthy, to do things that will... To keep the cost down. Exactly, well, the, of course. The, it's good for everybody. The problem, though, is, and again, it gets back to that, the old eating the young. The reason that specifically was excluded from Obamacare, in fact, forbidden from Obamacare is because it is, you make a market choice. You're 25 years old, you say, great, I'll do this and I'll use this amount. The problem is it didn't collect enough money to pay for the 60-year-old. And that's... And the whole uh, concept of Obamacare was using the young to pay for the old. Exactly. Uh, basically taxing, uh, grandparents taxing their grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Well, that helped uh, keep us from electing, uh, what's her name, Mrs. Clinton to a high office <laughs> once again. <laughs> Uh, th th that's that's worth that's worthwhile. That's yeah. a relief. Yeah, and there's a. Well, I guess I mentioned Medibed, where you could yeah. go online and well, get and prices. Uh, and uh, it seems that um, that the repeal is happening regardless. Uh, the the repeal is an effect is a fact. And all the headlines about, you know, fail to repeal, no, the repeal was, it, it, that's natural. The question is whether it would be replaced. So the You mean it's, it's natural in the sense that uh, all of the, uh, many insurance companies are saying, no more, we're not going to insure in this state, that state, or the other state. Uh, and in the sense that there are doctors who are saying, no, we're not going to take Medicaid, we're not even going to take Medicare anymore because we just don't want to deal with the back office problems. And uh, no, we are going to go to a, a fee-for-service model, uh, which, uh, we, you know, or, or we are going to, another, another method that's been used is where uh, religious groups will say, uh, we will, you know, pay in and, and, and pay out uh, based on uh, based on uh, on need, you know, pay in a certain amount and pay well, out. Well, if the on, federal on need. government isn't going to put money in and they're no, not going to yeah. enforce the mandate, there's no money coming in, and so it's yeah. all that the government had to do was just not do anything, and it was repealed. Right. Uh, I have two metaphors for this business about replace. And my view is that government meddling has created a lot of these problems. Uh, one, when a surgeon excises or removes a cancer, a tumor. It doesn't worry about what it's going to be replaced <laughs> it with. Didn't replace it with and, anything. And Thomas Sowell said, when a firefighter puts out a fire, he doesn't worry about replacing it with anything. <laughs> it solved the problem. And we solved the problem of, of, uh, of Obamacare by repeal, period. No repeal and replace. Forget about it. And forget about the people who are going to scream and holler and complain. Because it's really a very small number. And that's the show. We'll see you again next Very week, good. same time, Excellent. same place, on Libertarian Counterpoint, on the uh, uh, air at uh, Channel 17 in Sacramento, on uh, the web at www.accesssacramento.org, uh, on YouTube, and on uh, cable channels all over the place. Make sure you're listening at 8 p.m. on Thursday nights, noon on Fridays, and 4 a.m. on uh, Saturday morning. Uh, those are all Pacific Standard Time, and you know, adjust your your, your viewing habits depending on where you're watching. Terrific. Thank you very much, Lee Welter. Thank you very much, uh, Philip Larea, for being on the show. Thank you, Richard. Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have Philip Larea and Lee Re Lee Welter. Lee Welter is a, an emergency EMS instructor and a physician, and uh, we have uh, Philip Larea, who is the editor of Minute Dot, and uh, a book of poetry, brand new, brand newly published, called Part-Time Job. Welcome to the show. Um, we, I say we, I had a modicum, a sliver, a very tiny sliver of hope that Trump would not turn into the neocon that all of his predecessors have been, and I'm talking about all of them, Obama, uh, Bush the younger, Bush the older, uh, Clinton, they were all neocons in the sense that they would, couldn't find a, a war they didn't want to fight to support the military-industrial complex. 
And I thought that uh, the, some of the campaign rhetoric that we heard from Trump saying, we're going to uh, leave Assad alone, we're not going to get our, you know, mired down in some of these, some of these uh, hell holes in the Middle East, I thought maybe he was serious, maybe he'd be able to do that. But Assad allegedly, and I say allegedly because I think it may have been a false flag, allegedly gassed some people, 80, 90 people died of a gas attack somewhere in Syria. And immediately, or within, within days afterwards, in fact, this evening, as we tape on Thursday evening, the uh, 6th of, uh, of, of April, he, is, he has launched uh, 50 to 60 cruise miss missiles to a town, uh, about, or to an airstrip about 50 miles south of where the gas attack took place. Has Trump eaten the neocon Kool-Aid decided that he has he been co-opted by the military industrial complex to keep ever ever everlasting war going on forever in the middle east and elsewhere i i'm gonna hold that sliver of hope a little bit yet um uh, i thought uh, that he had his call it his kennedy moment with the cia with that uh, whole business in yemen a very small strike that uh, uh went south and uh and a soldier died and uh, there was a sense that, hmm, you know, that uh, he got bad information, he approved it, it went a little south. Um, I think that in this case, in this bombing, that he said, look, I've got to do something, and so here is my something, and it costs very little to do it, and I think he walks away from it. Uh, the to symbolic, in other words, it was a it was, it was exactly just a symbolic killing of. Uh, well, you have to, family. you know, we have we have adopted a very nuanced view in in the West of what a war crime is. Apparently, I was reminded that when, with this, I was reminded that the very last thing that Obama did with less than forty eight hours in office was a symbolic killing. Well, those were two hundred people that he killed. Yeah. Uh, those, that, those are uh, in Syria and Libya, and those are countries we are not ostensibly at war with. We have no declaration of war with them. Well, we have no declaration of war with anybody. We're offer, 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 operating under an authorization of force going back to 9-11 and the Afghanistan conflict. That's so, the, only, the only thing even resembling and that's and war. that's where I look at that, and I see those two hundred people are dead, and they weren't in. It wasn't an airstrike called in in close combat. <coughs> These were people just drilling around, uh, and you know, with 30, 36 hours left in office, one can only assume he did it just because he could. You know, there was no strategic reason why it had to be done at that moment, and not you know for the next president. So all I say is that um, we've gotten to this place where tit for tat, we have no moral high ground. My sense is that Trump uh, still is that Trump, you know, did something symbolic so he can say he did something, and uh, I doubt very much whether we're going to have more troops on the ground in Libya Well, we'll see. Uh, I certainly hope you're right. Uh, I, I, you know, I look at the, the uh, situation that Trump is in, where he has been accused by the left and really by the intelligence agencies, and I mean the intelligence agencies writ large, all of them, uh, leaking intelligence that he is supposedly in league with the Russians. Uh, and if uh, you uh, listened to Trump uh, shortly after he was uh, sworn in, he said, hey, Obama was spying on Trump Tower, and the press ridiculed him. Now it turns out that Susan Rice unmasked uh, mentions in intelligence surveillance records that uh, had something to do, that had mentions of Trump or Trump associates. Now, the dirty little truth is, and what the media is ignoring and what everybody is ignoring, is that everybody is under surveillance <coughs> all the time. Everybody. You, me, Trump, the dog catcher. We're all being listened to or taped or having our emails monitored. It's, 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 it's always going on. And it's being stored in a warehouse in, in, in Salt Lake City that takes you know, six, gen six uh, you know, uh, probably takes some hundreds of megawatts of electricity just to keep the servers going. That being the case, there is nothing that anybody does that can't be unmasked to their detriment. And so what Susan Rice did is she said, okay, let's figure out where anybody by the name of Trump or a Trump associate is mentioned. And we'll, we'll Take off the masking tape on that particular conversation. 
and will leak it to the media. That's where all of the, the uh, that's where all of the Russia did it uh, stuff came uh, from. And, and that's one of the reasons that these uh, people are bemoaning that Hillary Clinton was not elected to high office to protect them to continue this uh, uh, tradition. Brings to mind my favorite Wall Street Journal cartoon, which a young boy is looking up at his father and saying, Dad, I've decided to pursue a career in organized crime. Dad looks back and says, uh, government or private sector? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, 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 it <laughs> looks, if, if you look at recent history, it sure does look like a organized crime enterprise, doesn't it? Well, well yeah, organized exactly, it, yeah. exactly. And, and we're, what we're looking at is the as a surveillance state in league with a warfare state uh, in arms industry mm -hmm. that does everything they possibly can to keep Alexandria, Virginia in high clover, uh, to keep K Street in high clover, to keep the suburbs of Washington, D.C., the most prosperous suburbs in the country, bar none, which never get a recession. Uh, because people who are, who benefit from constant warfare, who benefit from constant conflict, who benefit from constant uh, lobbying back and forth between the Democrats and the Republicans and the rich and the poor and class against class and uh, race against race, etc., those people will benefit as long as conflict continues. As long as if conflict ends, they're out of a job because they don't have the brokering to do, they don't have the uh, weapons manufacturing to do, they don't have the uh, spy material to collect, nothing left to do. They have to go back to uh, uh, Idaho and, 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 and uh, raise potatoes or something. Well, one of the things that I thought was somewhat ironic about that is there was a big hullabaloo about um, uh, the Senate overturning the Obama-era privacy controls on the Internet. And it was, oh my gosh, how could they do such a thing? And I well, who is it? I, you know, if I if I look at a pair of shoes, Google knows about it. Where is my privacy to begin with? And so the whole deal was that they were going to be able to sell the information from your searches to advertisers and such. You mean that's not happening already? And so for all of the hullabaloo, aren't they, well, so what you're saying is that Comcast now Comcast can make the money instead of Google. And sometimes they're not very smart. I mean, I I, I or just anecdotally, I. Uh, uh, decided to uh, climb Kilimanjaro uh, in October. So I Wonderful. went to a company called Ultimate Kilimanjaro to book uh, a, a guide to climb Kilimanjaro, right? And ever since I did that, after I bought and paid Emails. for the, uh, the guide, I keep seeing Ultimate Kilimanjaro ads <laughs> pop up on Yahoo, pop up on Google, pop up on uh, Facebook, wherever I go, there's a, that stupid ad is following me around. I'm not in the market anymore. <laughs> sort of like that character in uh, uh, Little Abner comic strip, Joe, I guess yeah. it was his name, with the yeah. little black cloud that yeah. followed him everywhere. Yeah. yeah. We're That's all stuck yeah. like that, aren't yeah, we? Exactly. And exactly. this business of surveillance brings, uh, surveillance brings to mind a, a superb movie titled The Lives of Others about life in East Germany with the Stasi keeping track of everybody. Yeah, and that was, they, they did everything manually. I mean, well, they, they did, they did you know, it the hard way. They did it with, you know, eavesdroppers and snitches. Yeah. They didn't have the, the, uh, the you know, an old-fashioned wiretaps to the extent they had phones, which weren't, weren't all that prevalent. Now, it's all automatic. It's all, it's all you know, yes, all you got to do is, is go do a Google search and find out what Philip was talking about to his uh, ex-girlfriend 30 years ago. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but the, the nice thing about the movie, unlike our current situation, is that it had a relatively happy ending. There was a touch of humanity in the system. Yeah. I'm not sure we have that anymore. Yeah. In fact, we, we, could, we missed our opportunity. There was a very selfish gentleman named uh, Gary Johnson who intended to keep us out of war except for defense and had some other great ideas free market I My favorite watch. Facebook meme these days is uh, running a picture of Gary Johnson saying, uh, don't you wish you would have made a different decision? Oh, send it to, I, need a, I need to post that one. Don't blame me, I voted for Johnson. <laughs> anyway, anyway about one thing that, that Trump has done, which I totally support, is nominate Neil Gorsuch for the U.S. Supreme Court. This is a guy with pristine judicial qualifications. Now that's not to say that I agree with him on every issue, because I probably don't, 
but nobody exists that I would agree with on every issue uh, that will come before the courts. But as far as judicial temperament, as far as uh, ability and quali qualifications, you name it, this guy, this guy is probably one of the best nominees that we've seen in decades. Well, I and think the Democrats are, are trying to filibuster him. But today, the Senate got rid of the filibuster rule. They said, okay, you guys won't, you know, if you're going to try to filibuster this guy, we're going to employ the nuclear option. We're going to get rid of the filibuster and confirm uh, Gorsuch tomorrow, Friday the 7th, on a 50% uh, uh, vote. Terrific. Well, and, uh, you know, this one, uh, you know, the fact that he's a young man, I think he's 49, will dominate the court for 35 years. And as you say, his record is absolutely superb. And I think it shocked people. It was one of the first major nominations that uh, Trump had announced. And I think people were shocked at how good it was. And even the Democrats were a little nonplussed. At the, it was hard to get any traction on Gorsuch. That they could say, by golly, he's a, you know, yeah. anti-women. Right. That they are using um, uh, euphemisms for what I think is really going on. Everybody elected to office promises to protect and defend the Constitution. But we know that the Neil Gorsuch is going to truly protect and defend and honor this Constitution. The purpose at its, at its root of the Constitution and Declaration of, of Independence are to protect our fundamental human rights from government. It's legitimized. And he government. actually understands that and has enunciated that. That's that, why that they hate him. Yes. They don't like that. They exactly. don't want government to be limited and uh, but integrity. He had, is but he's of. essentially just replacing Scalia, who was the same way. Yes. Uh, and, and, and probably not quite as uh, flamboyant or, or quite as uh, original as, as Scalia, but close. But, yeah, but, but better looking. Yes. Uh, but the real question, uh, and the, t the interesting thing was whether the Democrats were going to force the end of the filibuster on this one or on Bader Ginsburg, and that's the one that's coming down the pike. Yeah, and so, so mean, right so now mean, you've yes. got the same thing that we had with Scalia. Well, yeah, uh, but right, now, one, right now the, court, the balance of the court doesn't change with the Gorsuch's nomination. Exactly. The next nomination is almost certain to be uh, uh, to replace one of the liberal members of the court. Uh, of, of the court, and that Breyer or, or uh, Ginsburg, and that will change the uh, the uh, the balance on the court or Kennedy. And the Democrats matter. couldn't decide whether to fight this battle or or by letting this one go be mm -hmm. a little more conciliatory because he's a superb choice. Yeah. They may have been able to. Um, that may have been that catalyst to say, hey, we can you know the when Bader Ginsburg retires, then you know appoint someone somewhat like Gorsuch. Don't give us. You know, you know Clarence Thomas, uh, who's not any worse anyway. But you know, yeah, so what know by forcing it this time? I mean, they really just said, I, you know, I think they blew it a little bit. The well, I, I think they're playing to their base, and I think that it was uh, bound to happen one t one one time or another. Exactly. Yeah. And so they just decided to go ahead and do it, and I, I think they made a mistake. But uh, I, I guess the question, well, tactically, the question, of course, becomes: Is this something that? Uh, you know, better watch out. What you, you better be careful what you wish for, because it's going to come back and bite the Republicans when the Democrats are in charge. Well, I think that he has. Um, you know, his record is as a uh, constitutional. No, no, I'm not talking about Gorsuch now. I'm talking about uh, the process. Two years from now, or four years from now, when the Democrats take over the Senate, if they do. If and then you know, going, there was that was never going to be any different anymore. I mean, here we are. Um, uh, there was never going to be well, a time of, part of uh, bipartisanship. The ultimate question that I'm getting at here is should Supreme Court nominees have a 60% vote as opposed to a 50% vote? Is there any reason why yeah, there yeah. should be a supermajority vote to, to uh, nominate a, a justice? Not when it means especially that you've had a vacancy for how long now? You know, about a year. Well, don't tell that to the Democrats. They'll going to start whining about Merrick. That, yes, yeah. they've yeah. been whining a lot about uh, that. But, yes. but Merrick did not get through because the Democrats lost the Senate. The well, Democrats lost the Senate for a reason. Yes. Yeah. Well, and also Merrick Garland was an awful nominee when it came to administrative law. He, did not, he, he never saw an administrative ruling that he would not wholeheartedly support. He, he was all about deference to uh, bureaucrats, mm -hmm. which, is, which is death to freedom. But it wouldn't have made any difference if, if, yeah. the, if the Democrats had 52, <coughs> as they had control of the Senate, if that had all happened five years yeah. earlier. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, 
fortunately, all, the entire court is getting younger. So we said Robert thing, Toledo and yeah, we we said one thing that we like about Trump. Let's talk about something that at least I despise about Trump. It's called the border wall, and just w among many other reasons for despising the border wall is the fact that uh, a real the real border wall losers will be not immigrants, not natives, but ranchers, homeowners, anybody that else anybody else that uses property along the border, which will have to be acquired by eminent domain and probably at fire sale prices. Oh, I thought they got compensated fairly when the government... Uh, exactly, fire sale, fire sale prices. Well, but of course, that's yeah. the way it goes. And uh, even worse than that is that, uh, to my knowledge, immigrants, at least first-generation immigrants, are more peaceful and more productive than our average or our typical citizen. Oh, absolutely. Yes. and. First, second, probably third. But the, generation. the Democrats had a chance to normalize our immigration laws. Why didn't they do it if it was that important? And why don't we do it now? We, well, we could I, do much, much better. I, 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 yeah, I'll take, I'll take a contrarian view, and I, you know, I think the wall is a, is a ridiculous thing. You know, maybe it'd be great architecture. <coughs> who knows? But Trump is forcing the immigration <coughs> question in a way that Obama was elected in the first term specifically to address that. That was his Latino base, uh, and he never did. But think about it this way, and California is very much, now we're considering being a sanctuary state. What if the real reason that, we're not talking about immigration, we're talking about illegal immigration. So what is illegal immigration? It's worker exploitation. So California's economy no, it, depends yeah, I, on... I, I categorically deny, deny that there's any exploitation of somebody who comes here willingly to work. If they're coming here willingly to work, I don't care if you're paying them a dime an hour, it's not exploitation, because they came here willingly. Okay, but if I'll they be, come but here I'll, unwillingly, a slave, I'll, that's exploitation. But I'll take the other side of that and say that, yes, I think that we would you know, say, hey, let them all come in, but count them when they come. You know, everybody is pretty much legal coming in, and only somebody who really means to do you harm will come in illegally then. But what I'm saying is that we have this two-tier system where we say these people are legal and these people are not. The people who are here on green card status or work visas yeah, well, have protection under the law. Yeah. The people who are illegal do not. Yeah. So what does it say about Democrats in this yeah. state that want to make sure those immigrants stay illegal. Well, it's th that's not just in the state. It's, f it's a federal problem. Our immigration laws are a mishmash with absolutely no uh, common thread among them. They uh, serve no purpose, whether it's safety, whether it's uh, uh, control of the number of people uh, coming into the country, whether it's uh, a fairness to the people who do arrive. They serve zero purpose. There is no line to get into. There is no line to get at the, at the back of as far as immigration is concerned. The immigration line, uh, laws are entirely uh, irrational and should be, the best thing we could do about to, uh, to reform immigration would be simply to re repeal every immigration law on the books, 100% repeal them and replace them like Obamacare <laughs> with nothing. <laughs> Go back to 1900 and see well, what already, you the, the one law not to repeal would be that you can't get welfare for five years after arriving in the country. That's a law. Most people forget about that. Most immigrants don't want to go on welfare in the first place right. and don't go on welfare because they can't because it's illegal and until you've been here for five years. I'd extend that for 10 or 15 but, uh, or, or forever, but, uh, but I do that for Native American or Native uh, citizens as well. But the fact is that the only uh, public uh, cost of immigrants is two things, emergency room service and education of uh, elementary, uh, L high education. Those are the only few things that we have a net cost when it comes to immigrants is concerned. When it comes to taxes that are paid in, immigrants pay social security tax. They probably pay it on a fake card, a fake social security card, but it still goes into the system and they go back well, to Mexico to retire. sales taxes and every and other, sales tax you and know. property taxes and all the and excise taxes yeah. and the whole, whole line. And property taxes through rent. It, you know, they pay the taxes, but they don't really collect a lot because most of them go back to Mexico or wherever to retire. In fact, net migration for the last few years has been negative. More people are leaving, 
going back home than are coming here. Well, so if, the whole if, issue, if, the whole issue is a, is a Tampa a teapot. If if we look at if we look at 1900 as that place where progressivism began and the unintended consequences of saying there'll be this kind of program but it won't apply to these and you end up with this what we have today uh, and, and in 1900 people came you know Ellis Island mm -hmm. Statue of Liberty they came people counted them and said here you are okay we know who you are. But there were no real rules or laws against it. Yeah, them. prior to the uh, exclusion of, of uh, Chinese back in the uh, after the after the uh, gold rush, there yeah. were no immigration laws whatsoever. In fact, one of the clauses in the Declaration of Independence complains about the uh, King of England uh, hindering emigration to these United States. Mm -hmm. They were complaining that there wasn't enough immigration. And to this day, you know, we are a country of 330 million people or so. This with country room for, is with room empty. For, with room for 10 or 15 times that many. Oh, it, it's empty. Yeah. You know, we, we are in our 25 cities and we think we're crowded, but 90% of the United States is, is empty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, the, uh, the whole idea of population uh, growth or population bomb, all that has been discredited ever since. Juan Ehrlich made the bet with, uh, with Paul er Paul, er Paul, Juan, er Paul. Juan, Paul Ehrlich and Juan uh, Williams. No, that was Juan, I forget. Uh, some guy made a bet with, uh, with But Ehrlich. it was Ehrlich. <laughs> and Ehrlich lost. And the bet was whether or not the commodity prices. price, uh, pardon me? Oh, about prices of... of well, the commodity of prices commodity would go up right. by 1990. This is a bet made back in the scarcity 70s. Scarcity argument. Yeah, yeah. scarcity argument. And, and he lost b badly because the prices of commodities ultimately went down. The other problem, of course, with immigration is that it gives one more excuse, as if we didn't have enough already, for more airport searches and civil liberties violations of all kinds. And uh, just recently, D the new DHS secretary... Uh, Department of Homeland Security Secretary John Kelly said that airport searches of cell phones will continue. What are we going to find on a cell phone search? Probably some high explosive, I would think, if you're really being pessimistic about it, but I don't totally understand. Is there something else? No, I think what they're doing is they're doing a cell phone search, you know, looking at their their uh, social media accounts and looking at the emails. Oh, I see. They're getting lessons from the uh, the, the uh, distant uh, moolahs on how to destroy the infidels, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, something well, like that. That seems sort of crazy, doesn't well, it? Well, what they're, what the they're the saying is there is some sort of um, credible threat that has come across in various, you know, all the various intelligence agencies saying that they're apparently implanting bombs inside of laptops. And that okay, to explode well, those laptops, um, and then they, so that's uh, and they say that this is on, you know, this is on actionable intelligence. Uh, you know, I'm personally going to give them the benefit of the doubt on well, that. Well, maybe. Uh, I think we missed. But I think what we have to do before we give anybody the benefit of the doubt, anybody in the government the benefit of the doubt, anything, is get kind, of, you know, relax a little bit, maybe have a glass of wine. Uh, in fact, <laughs> Yale School of Medicine professor Gordon Shepard, man after my own heart, says, drinking wine save, gives the brain a workout, uh, engaging the brain more than music or solving math equations. But you've got to swallow the wine. As a medical doctor, is he, uh, is he uh, talking good medicine? To my knowledge, no. And I, <laughs> I can give a couple of examples. There was a report within the past several months that the intake of alcohol, starting with zero, increases the risk of cancer, which means one drink is going to increase your risk of cancer, not as much as two or five or 10 or 50 or what have you, but uh, it, it is a risk factor. That's well, I'm sure it's, it's a, it could be. I mean, that's a different issue. What he's talking about is it being, it being a, a brain activator, a brain uh, exciter. Well, I, uh, I, I, I tested out the theory before the show tonight. I, I feel that I have been you know, pretty sharp tonight. Would you agree? You, you or uh, all right. then I'm going to test it again a little later after the show, just to see whether or not um, I'm noticeably sharper than I was. <laughs> yeah. One other comment. Uh, I recall hearing a radio interview. This is uh, J.P. McCarthy, one of the best in the business, talking to a representative of, of the wine industry, who was talking about all the uh, what have you and. I think you've been a good line. Yes. Okay, let's...
Not nearly as